In this tutorial, we will continue the discussion of sampling in quantitative research by having a look at probability and non-probability sampling methods. As I mentioned in previous video, sampling methods fall into two categories, probability and non-probability sampling. The essential feature of probability sampling is that each element in the sampling frame has the same probability of being included in the sample, and that probability is non-zero. To use probability sampling, we need to have a sampling frame that is a list of elements in the population that can be accessed or contacted. A sampling frame is necessary to determine each element's probability of being selected. In non-probability sampling, some elements in the sampling frame have either zero probability of being selected or the probability is unknown. As a consequence, we cannot accurately determine the margin of error and it is impossible to know the likelihood that the sample is representative of the population. There are several types of probability sampling and I will discuss simple random sampling, systematic sampling, cluster sampling and multi-stage sampling. The most basic form of probability sampling is simple random sampling. In simple random sampling, each element in the sampling frame has an equal and independent probability of being included in the sample. Independent means that the selection of any single element does not depend on any other element being selected first. In other words, every possible combination of elements is equally likely to be sampled. Systematic random sampling is a related method aimed to obtain a random sample. In systematic sampling, only the first element is selected using a random number and then the other elements are selected by systematically skipping a certain number of elements. For example, on this illustration, we choose every third element. In stratified sampling, we divide the population into mutually exclusive strata. We sample from each stratum separately using simple random sampling. The separately sampled elements are added together to form the final sample. Stratified random sampling is useful for two reasons. First, it allows to ensure that, at least in terms of the sample strata, our sample is representative. This means that subpopulations are represented in the sample exactly in the same proportion as they appear in the population. For example, we have equal proportion of males and females if we feel that males and females represent 50% of the population accordingly. With simple random sampling, we can expect the sample to be representative in the long run, but due to chance, strata may be over or underrepresented. The second reason stratification is useful is because it makes sampling more efficient. This means that, all other things being equaled, we can achieve smaller margin of error with the same sample size. Cluster sampling allows us to use random sampling without going bankrupt. Consider sampling frames that consist of all consumers or all employees or all managers in a certain country. If we were to randomly select elements from those frames, we would have to travel all over. In most cases, this is just too expensive. And the solution is to randomly sample in stages by first selecting clusters of elements. Say we want to sample employees within multinational subsidiaries. In the first stage, we draw a list of subsidiaries and cluster them into countries. We then randomly select a small number of countries and we use stratification, for example, to make sure that we include developing countries. In the second stage, we then select subsidiaries within the countries previously selected. In the third stage, employees are randomly sampled from the previously selected subsidiaries. Multi-stage cluster sampling makes random sampling feasible, but the margin of error is hard to determine because the probability to be included in the sample is no longer the same for all elements of the population. Also, cluster sampling is usually associated with a larger margin of error. In non-probability sampling, some elements in the sampling frame have either zero probability of being selected or the probability is unknown. As a consequence, we cannot accurately determine the margin of error and it is impossible to say what's the likelihood of the sample being representative of the population. Although the risk of bias is high, convenience samples are used very often. This is because sometimes it's simply impossible to obtain a sampling frame. In other cases, the effort and expense necessary to obtain a sampling frame are just not worth it.
there are several types of non-probability sampling, including convenience sampling, snowball sampling, quarter sampling, or purposive slash theoretical slash judgment sampling. Convenience sampling, or accidental sampling, is the simplest form of non-probability sampling. In convenience sampling, elements are selected that are the most convenient or the most accessible. In snowball referral sampling, initially a small group of participants is recruited. The sample is then extended by asking the initial participants to provide contact information for possible new participants. The new participants are also asked to supply contacts and so it goes. If all participants refer new ones, the initially small sample can grow quite large very quickly. Quota sampling is superficially similar to stratified random sampling in that participants in the sample are distinguished according to characteristics such as gender, age, ethnicity or educational level and then the relative size of each category in the population is obtained from some objective data such as national statistics and this information is used to calculate how many participants are needed in each category so that the relative category sizes in the sample correspond to the category sizes in the population. However, instead of randomly selecting elements from each stratum, participants for each category are selected using convenience sampling and elements are sampled until the quota in all categories are met. Purposes, judgment or theoretical sampling occurs when elements of the population are specifically chosen based on the judgment of the researcher. A purposive sample can consist of elements that are judged to be typical for the population or of only extreme elements. For example, you might purposely sample only failing enterprises to see what do they have in common. Elements can also be purposely chosen because they are very much alike or reversely because they are very different. For example, to get an idea of the range of values in population, you may sample best versus worst performing farms. Or elements can consist of people who are judged to be experts, for example when research concerns opinions on matter that require special knowledge. A special case of purposive sampling is a theoretical sampling where you theoretically defined units to be sampled and then sample them progressively until you find you have not obtained any new insights knowledge or the units do not generate knowledge that contradicts your previous findings. Such theoretical sampling is found in qualitative research. As I mentioned before, probability sampling is considered a better option because it's free of error and biases or it's less likely to be affected of error and biases. But probability sampling is rarely found in management research. Usually we go with convenience samples simply because sampling frames are not available. How do we go about sampling? We tend to begin by defining the population of interest for example, employees, firms, consumers, etc. Then we try to identify a sampling frame and depending whether we can find one, we proceed to choose either probability or non-probability sampling. This choice is dictated in part by feasibility, but in part by time and cost of data collection. We do also consider sample size and we'll come back to this issue in the section devoted to assessment of research quality.